Hey there guys, Nordic Warrior here, back with another video. So, let's talk about this upcoming fight that's taking place next week, I believe, at £154 between Terence Crawford and the current champion in that division, uh, Israel Madrimov. Uh, Crawford, of course, is moving up from the welterweight division, and he's going to be attempting to uh, win a world title in his fourth weight division. Uh, he's, of course, at this point in time... Um, the undisputed, well, I believe he's vacated some of the titles now, but he was, up until very recently, the undisputed welterweight champion. So it's only natural that he moves up and challenges for another title in another division if he wants to continue his career. So, yeah, that's kind of what he's doing. Now, when I first heard that this fight was announced, I'm talking about the Madrimov fight, I didn't really take much notice of it. Didn't really take much notice of it at all because, to me, it seemed like it was probably just a formality. And what I mean by that is, we kind of know the script at this point with Terence Crawford, don't we? You know, I've, I've talked about this many times in the past. We know how his fights go. We know how they're expected to go. And we know that he's one of these guys who I would consider a chosen one in boxing, and what I mean by that is he's a guy who always seems to have everything laid out before him, and every single fight seems to be carefully structured and set up in a way that suits him. Now, I'm going to go off on a, a little tangent here just to clarify what I'm saying for anybody who's new. Now, I've talked about this many times in the past in live streams, and I've briefly covered it in videos and whatnot, but... Terence Crawford, in my personal opinion, is one of these fighters who, as good as he is, and don't get it twisted, he's very good, but as good as he is, in my opinion, a lot of what he brings to the table is largely smoke and mirrors, and he's one of these fighters who, in my personal opinion, is largely manufactured, and what I mean by that is, if you look at Terence Crawford's record, just looking at his record, like, like ignoring the details, ignoring the opponents, just looking at his record as it is, and the accolades that he has on his record, he has one of the most incredible, legendary records you will ever see in boxing, particularly just as it stands on paper. You know, you look at Crawford's record, and uh, take it purely at face value, it's astonishing. Like, it, it, in some ways, it even rivals Canelo's record on paper. And that is, you look at how many fights this guy's had. I think he's, what, had around 40 professional fights, something like that. He's undefeated. He has an incredible knockout percentage, particularly at world level. I mean, I don't believe this guy has even come close to going the distance in a number of years now. And he's been fighting at world level, of course. And if you look at the accolades he has, you know, being a, a three-division world champion, as well as a two-time undisputed champion and multiple-time lineal champion, it's phenomenal. It's astonishing. And the amount of successful title defenses this guy has uh, against decent opposition, not always the best opposition, but decent opposition... It's legendary. It really is. Just looking at the record as it is, you can't question how amazing it is or how amazing it looks. But here's the thing with Crawford. Once you dig a little bit deeper and once you analyse his fights, once you analyse the situations and the circumstances surrounding his fights, there always seems to be something that is fishy about them, isn't there? There always seems to be some sort of stipulation or some sort of sabotaging going on, some sort of legality, and every single one of his most consequential fights, the opponents always seem to be compromised in some way, whether it's a weight stipulation, whether it's an injury of some kind, you know, getting shot in the leg, uh, being in a terrible car accident and being quote-unquote, you know, diagnosed brain damaged and half-blind, you know, coming off jaw surgery, uh, being badly beaten up and concussed in your previous fight to the point where most people considered you beaten and, and, and say that you should have been stopped. 
You know, there always seems to be something like that going on in the most consequential fights of Terence Crawford's career. You know, these guys get in the ring with him and they're always compromised and there always seems to be something wrong with him. Not only that, but there always seems to be some sort of controversy that gets swept under the carpet, be it situation with his gloves or, like I mentioned before, you know, weight stipulations, um, you know, int intimidation of some kind, um, you know, opponents showing up and just looking absolutely drained and, and having no energy you know, no energy, no motivation, like, there just always seems to be something wrong with these guys, all his fights take place in America, you know, he always seems to be the A-side, even when he shouldn't be, and, you know, he gets away with absolute murder in the ring, you know, like, like, winning fights on a low blow, and pulling opponents to the canvas, and having it considered a knockdown, there just seems to always be something, doesn't there, with Crawford? And that's why I say, as good as he is, and he is good, don't get it twisted. In my personal opinion, he's one of these fighters who's not as good as his record suggests. So, I just wanted to get that out there before I go any further. So, yeah, I didn't pay any attention whatsoever. Didn't take any notice of this fight when it was first announced. Because I just kind of thought it was a formality... Um, you know, Crawford's going to be getting his fourth um, championship or, or a championship in his fourth division uh, going after a title. And I kind of figured that they had selected the right opponent in their mind. You know, they had found a guy who was inexperienced enough and beatable enough for Crawford to go up and, and get his uh, fourth division world title. So, yeah, I, I kind of thought that it was what it was. It was just kind of a setup. Now, I'm not saying that that's changed. I'm not saying that I now all of a sudden think that Madrimov is some some amazing threat or that this fight's going to be an upset. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that upon looking at Madrimov a little bit closer, uh, watching some of his highlights and just analysing him as a fighter a little bit further and a little bit deeper and just assessing in my mind what attributes he brings to the table, I gotta be honest with you guys, and call me crazy, but if this fight is 100% legit, let's give boxing the benefit of the doubt and say, if there's no weight stipulation for this fight, if there's no dodgy glove situation, if there's no corruption in regards to the referee or the judges or the drug testing commission or the timekeeper, or anything like that, there's no intimidation, there's no bribery, let's just give boxing the benefit of the doubt, and let's just assume that this event, and this particular fight, is 100% legit, and 100% above board, and 100% free from any, you know, and, and I hate talking, you know, any corruption at all, and I hate talking about this, and this is one of the reasons I don't like doing I don't like doing prediction videos because I always find myself wondering, like, before I even break down the fight and how it should logically go, I always find myself wondering, is it even going to be a real fight? Is the whole thing just going to be flat out rigged or is it going to be a genuine competitive fight for a genuine championship with both guys coming to win? Because giving this fight the benefit of the doubt... I honestly think this is a very, very difficult fight to call, and a very intriguing one. And if you look at Madrimov, now, he isn't the most experienced fighter out there. I mean, the guy's only had about 11 or 12 professional fights. Now, he did have a pretty extensive amateur background, to, to my knowledge. I mean, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I have heard that he had a pretty extensive amateur background. And you would assume so with him um, becoming world champion in you know, such a few amount of fights, such a few number of fights. So, but you have to look at his uh, professional career on its own and not really think too much about his amateur career because amateur boxing and professional boxing are very, very different. I mean, there's similarities, don't get me wrong, but they're very, very different. You know, amateur boxing is over three or four rounds, um, you know, the the scoring system and criteria is very different, the officiating is very different, so you, you can't really always look at a guy's amateur background and assume that that experience is going to make him a world-class professional, 
So I definitely think that the lack of experience going into this fight will be a problem for Madrimov. But just looking at Madrimov and what he brings to the table in terms of his physical attributes, this is a very hard fight. A very, very hard fight for Crawford. And if this guy's genuinely coming to win, if there's no weight stipulation, if there's no loaded gloves, if there's no BS and no controversy going into this fight, I would not be at all surprised if this guy did a number on Terence Crawford because... As I've talked about in the past, Terence Crawford, as good as he is, he is so beatable. Like, this guy is very, very beatable. You know, his defense, I'm not going to say it's poor, but it's leaky, you know, at best. Like, I've seen this guy get hit so many times in fights. When he got when he fought uh, Aegis Kavalauskas, you know, big puncher, strong guy, but very, very limited and not that great technically and, uh, you know, not really that great an athlete. Crawford was hit in that fight, and he was hurt, and he was knocked down, and he was outboxed for stretches of it. Now, Crawford was able to outlast the guy, and was able to break him down and stop him in the mid-rounds. Um, I suspect likely due to the weight stipulation and whatever was in Crawford's gloves. But, you know, the fact that, that Crawford was outboxed and dropped by a guy like that makes me wonder if he can handle the power of a world-class 154-pounder who's fully replenished and rehydrated, because that's going to be a, a tough ass. Crawford's never fought anybody that's that's bigger than him, and I'm not saying that Madrimov's size in, in, in itself will be much of an issue, because I do think him and Crawford are a similar size naturally, but Madrimov's a guy who's been fighting his entire career, I think, at 154, and he's probably fought bigger punches, or, or at least, um, you know, you know, guys who are in general bigger punchers than the guy who, than the guys who's Crawford's fought in his recent fights. You know, he's, he's fought guys who probably rehydrate a lot more in that division, and w- with Crawford getting pieced up by the likes of Amir Khan, getting outboxed for a couple of rounds by David Avanesian, who landed a lot of punches on him inside. You know, with with him being outboxed here and there by Sean Porter, you know, with him being, um, you know, being made to run around the ring and and spoil and be very negative and foul and and showboat to try and get his lick back in the uh, Victor Postal fight. You know, Victor Postal, nowhere near as big a puncher or as physically strong as someone like Madrimov. It's going to be interesting, and another thing that I find quite interesting about Madrimov is his fighting style, because, you know, he's he's not your typical Eastern European fighter. He's a guy who's very, very wild in his approach. Do you know who he actually reminds me of? And I don't know if you guys will agree with this, but in a lot of ways, he reminds me of Mike Tyson. And the reason for that is Madrimov is a guy who is quite short and stocky and well-built, but he's not, like, overly muscular. You know, he doesn't look like a bodybuilder, but he is very, very ripped. Like, he's always ripped to the bone. And you see him when he fights, he'll sometimes square up, like Mike Tyson used to. You know, Mike Tyson wouldn't always be in a, a, a traditional boxing stance. He would sometimes square up so that he could get equal power from each side of his body, you know, whether he was throwing a left hook or a right hook, he would kind of wind up on them, and, you know, he would, he would, he would have kind of his, his hands by his chest sometimes, and, and that's so that he can kind of throw those little scooping uppercuts from mid-range, you know, bend at the waist, come up with a scooping uppercut, then a, a big swinging overhand right, and, and, and he, he'll, he'll even switch his stance at times, because that's something that Mike Tyson used to do, like, in his prime when he was in close, he would, he would literally, like, throw a right hand, switch to southpaw, throw a left hook, switch back to orthodox, throw a right hook, and, and he was very versatile on the inside, that's kind of what I see from Madrimov, he's a guy who's very, very aggressive, you know, hyper-aggressive, I would say, you know, he reminds me of those old Baz Rutan videos, you know, when Baz Rutan would talk about, he would talk about Mike Tyson's style, and he would talk about, like, when he hits the heavy bag, you know, he stands in front of it head-on, so that he can rip hooks from either side. That's just what comes to my mind when I look at Madrimov, and he seems to be ambidextrous. He seems to get equal power from either hand. Like, when he fought Ma- when he fought uh, Magomed Kurbanov, he-, he would stick, like, a stiff, 
hard left jab to the body, which he would kind of lunge into, and then he would transition that into an overhand right. Now, that does come with some problems, because, you know, if you're going to lunge with a jab to the body, you're leaving your yourself wide open for a, a counter right hook, you know, and, and if Crawford is fighting in a southpaw stance, he's pretty proficient with that, you know, he can counter punch here and there. But I think that Madrimov, his timing, despite how wild he is, his timing looks pretty good. He doesn't really get hit much when he fights. Um, you know, he, he seems to have uh, pretty good situational awareness in the ring. Uh, he seems to be very, very physically fit too. Like, I've never really seen the guy gas in a fight. Um, every single punch he throws, like even, even that quick jab to the body, he throws with full power. You know, just one of these guys who who isn't in there thinking about going the distance. He's in there trying to take your head off. Again, he's a Mike Tyson type of fighter. So, to me, the kind of attributes that he brings to the table, and when you consider that Crawford is moving up to his division, I honestly think this guy has a perfect opportunity to win this fight. If this is a real fight, and like I said, if there's no stipulations that favor Crawford, I honestly think this is this could or this could turn out to be the toughest fight of Crawford's career. I mean, you have to favor Crawford based on accomplishments, based on experience. You know, he's fought at this level so many times, and he's had the politics in his favor so many times that it would be logical to assume that he's going to have the politics in his favor here. But there's just something about Madrimov, man. Like, like I look at this guy, and I'm not deluding myself into thinking that he's definitely coming to win or that he's not going to be weight-drained with a, a rehydration clause or something. But without a rehydration clause, I struggle to see how Crawford is going to do to this guy what he did to Kavalowskis or Sean Porter or, um, you know, Postal. Like, like is, is he going to be able to just run around and, and pot shot his way to victory against this guy? Will this guy let him do that? Is he going to be able to just walk through this guy, you know, get up off the canvas if necessary? and break him down and stop him, I mean, guys, Craw Terence Crawford went life and death with Ricky Burns at lightweight, and, and f for stretches of that fight, I mean, he won the fight, clearly, don't get me wrong, but for stretches of that fight, he did get outboxed, you know, he, he, he was getting pieced up and schooled at times by Amir Khan, before, like, like, eventually just being stronger and more powerful, breaking him down and, you know, stopping him with a low blow, essentially, you know, he got schooled for a couple of rounds against Kel Brook, who was dangerously weight-drained for the fight and couldn't take a punch because of it, had no stamina because of it. You know, have we ever seen Terence Crawford... And, and, and by the way, all of those guys were compromised in some way. Have we ever seen Terence Crawford fight a guy who is bigger than him and who's fully replenished, fully hydrated and isn't in, in some way, shape, or form compromised. Have we ever seen it? I don't know if we have. Like, that's the thing that, that's always playing on my mind with Terence Crawford, is at any point in time, this guy could have a fight where the opponent just shocks him, where the opponent makes him pay for his bad habits and the mistakes that he makes in the ring. And I don't know, I've got a feeling about this one. I'm not saying that Madrimov's going to win, but I've got a feeling that Terence Crawford's going to get chin-checked in this fight. And if it's a real fight, we're going to see what Crawford's made of. Like, I don't know, man. Like, this, fight, this fight's fascinating to me. It really is. The more I think about it, the more it fascinates me. This guy has the perfect opportunity to do a number on Terence Crawford, to, to pull off one of the biggest upsets of this year. And the more I think about it, the more possible I think it is. So... Yeah, I'm sure some people are going to take this video out of context. They're going to say that I'm hating on Crawford or I'm just picking him to lose because I don't like him or whatever. But, I mean, look, all you got to do is do five minutes of research on Crawford and, and look into the details going into all of his fights. Because every single one of them had something up. You know, every single one of them, there was something wrong with the opponent. Look, R Ricky Burns literally had a broken jaw several months prior in his previous fight and then went in and fought Crawford and made it the distance and made it a competitive fight, you know. 
<laughs> Benavidez was shot in the leg, literally shot in the leg before he fought Crawford and had terrible mobility and balance issues because of it. You know, Kel Brook, you know, had had his eye socket broken in two separate fights. Um, again, we, we, I don't even need to tell you what happened with with Errol Spence. That that guy had to have his teeth replaced and everything. He had a detached retina. You know, he had <laughs> severe brain damage. I don't even know why I'm laughing because that's not even funny. But I mean, just the idea that one of Terence Crawford, probably his biggest fight, you know, the the most noteworthy opponent he's beaten had literal brain damage. I, I mean, that that cannot be overstated enough. And that's without even taking into consideration the weight stipulations. Is, is this a potential banana skin for Crawford? It, it could be. This could be a, a, this could be a banana skin for Crawford, man. It could be. So, uh, yeah, interesting fight. Um, let me know what you guys think anyway. I had more I wanted to say, but... I don't know, maybe in my next live stream I'll I'll talk a little bit more. So yeah, thanks for watching. Uh God bless.